Welcome to Orion Philosophy, where we explore, discuss and dissect areas of practical philosophy for use in everyday life. There is a philosophy that's been used for thousands of years all across the world by people from all walks of life to help develop a calm, resilient mentality and ultimately alleviate suffering, leaving us with a life of well-being and happiness. Buddhism is a school of thought that's often described as a religion, philosophy or simply a set of beliefs. But at its core, it's the practice of following the works and teachings of the Buddha, promoting inner peace, wisdom and following a way of life that aims to lead us to enlightenment. This word enlightenment can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people and to many people it carries a bit of spiritual baggage along with it. So for the purposes of this, I'm going to use the definition that an enlightened person sees the nature of the world around them, the people around them and themselves with absolute clarity. They view things just as they are and they live in accordance with what they see, much like the stoic practice of living in accordance with nature. This is the goal of the Buddhist teaching to use clarity of thought and vision to achieve a state of being that is free from suffering. And in this video, we go through exactly what Buddhism is and how practically to use those practices to live better lives. To begin, I think the best way to understand the intent of the Buddhist practice is to understand who created it and what they were trying to do. Over 2,600 years ago, there was an Indian boy born in present day Nepal, supposedly born to a king and queen. For the most part, his wealth protected him from the outside world. However, early writings of the period suggest that he became deeply moved when leaving the walls of his palace and seeing the suffering that seemed to be everywhere around him and the endless cyclical nature of birth, suffering, death, birth, suffering, death, with suffering being sandwiched between birth and death forever. Feeling so profoundly about what he was seeing, Siddhartha Gautama left the walls of his home, surrendered his wealth and began to seek a way of life that would lessen or even remove completely the suffering in the people he saw around him. This liberation from suffering is also known as Nirvana. On his journey, he practiced different meditation techniques, philosophy, fasting and breath control. But none of these practices gave him the liberation of suffering that he was looking for. They were not leading him to Nirvana. As the story goes, Siddhartha then took himself and sat under the leaves of a fig tree and began to meditate. He sat and waited until his meditation peeled away the layers of automatic reactions and automatic responses to thoughts and the outside world. This ultimately left him in a state of mind where he could contemplate clearly. And eventually in this state, he found some of the answers he was looking for. So what did he find and how can we use this in our day-to-day -day life? Perhaps the most important teaching from the Buddha was the concept of the Four Noble Truths. These truths are observations about reality that are observed when one has become a noble one. A noble one being someone who has reached nirvana and can see the true nature of existence and reality. These truths are core to the path of reaching spiritual enlightenment and they are thought to provide profound insight simply in knowing them. These truths are as follows. The first is Dukkha, commonly translated as suffering, unhappiness and pain, unsatisfactoriness or stress. This is the truth that refers to the habitual experience of a mundane life as fundamentally unsatisfactory and painful. It is the understanding that suffering is an innate characteristic of existence, specifically for those who are unenlightened. This suffering is largely caused by our tendency to crave and cling to things which are impermanent, like possessions, money, experiences and people. The reason this leads to suffering is in expecting happiness from states and things that are in their very nature impermanent, we can never find lasting resilient happiness. The happiness we do find is fleeting and fragile. It can easily slip away like sand between our fingertips, causing us to move on to the next thing and then the next. And then we're caught in this loop of jumping from one thing to another to try and find that happiness and fill that hole that we've been conditioned to think is filled with things like money and possessions. However, tragically, people commonly search for something that cannot be found in the place they're searching. The second truth is Samadaya. This is translated as origin, arising or coming together and explains the cause of Dukkha, the first truth that translated as suffering. Samadaya is the truth that the circle of birth, suffering and death continues because of human nature's tendency to desire, cling to and thirst for transient and impermanent sources of happiness. This often comes in the craving to experience pleasure and the craving to avoid pain. In reality, many people try to seek out pleasure in impermanent things and ultimately find pain in things like addiction, 
and many people trying to avoid pain close themselves off to finding lasting pleasure because fear prevents them from exploring the world and putting themselves into different situations. The truth is often somewhere in the middle. So like many things, this comes down to balance. And later on, we're going to be touching on balance as a specific concept to use in our day-to-day -day life. The third noble truth is called Naroda. This translates as cessation, suppression, or renouncing, basically letting go. This is the truth that dukkha, or suffering, can in fact be prevented. If a person renounces the thirst, desire, craving, and clinging, and stops the constant search for pleasure and the continual avoidance of pain, they can achieve nirvana. But as you may be thinking, this is not as easy as it sounds. And of course, you would be correct. But just because something is difficult does not mean it's not worth doing. Renouncing these things will take a huge amount of discipline. It takes time to build habits, and it will take a massive amount of personal accountability and responsibility. But many people are looking for the thing that comes with the end result. So it's likely that that hard work is probably worth it. The fourth and final noble truth is Maga. This is the truth that follows the path called the Noble Eightfold Path. It is the path leading to the confinement of Tana. Tana being craving, desire, and thirst. And in confining Tana, we can find Dukkha. Again, Dukkha being suffering, stress, and unhappiness. By following this path, practicing self-restraint, developing discipline and responsibility, practicing mindfulness and meditation, a person can begin to separate themselves from craving and clinging to impermanent things and begin to lead themselves down the path to enlightenment. This eightfold path refers to the way of understanding that the world, by its very nature, is fleeting and unsatisfying. Therefore, externals are not a reliable source of well-being and happiness. It is the understanding that craving and desire are the hooks that keep us tied to the impermanent things, and by extension, tied to suffering. The Eightfold Path promotes a friendly and compassionate attitude to others, a correct way of behaving, a conscious development of controlling the mind through learning not to cling to negative thoughts and emotions, learning to nurture positive thoughts, and a constant awareness of feelings and responses that arise within the body. To make this as clear as possible, the Eightfold Path numbered 1 through 8 are as follows. Right view. Our actions have consequences. Death is not the end and the consequences of our actions and beliefs echo after death. Right resolve or intention, the giving up of home and adopting a simpler life in order to follow the path. This concept specifically aims at peaceful renunciation, moving into an environment of non-sensuality, non-ill will, and away from cruelty. Right speech, no lying, no rude speech, no telling one person what another says about him to cause discord or harm to their relationship. Right conduct or action. No killing, no injury, no taking what is not given. No sexual misconduct, no material desires. Right livelihood. No trading in weapons, living beings, meat, liquor, and poisons. Right effort. This is making an effort to prevent the arising of unwholesome states and generating wholesome states. Right mindfulness. Being mindful of the teachings that are beneficial to the Buddhist path. And lastly, right consciousness. This is the path of practicing meditation to shift your conscious state. Some of these aren't that feasible or reasonable for those of us with jobs, families or commitments preventing us from giving up our homes and living the monastic lifestyle. But regardless of how far down this road we can go, there is a lot of wisdom in Buddhism that can help us get a little closer to Nirvana, reduce suffering in our life, and learn to cultivate habits that not only prevent us from falling into the trap of desires, attachment and craving, but help us develop habits that can develop compassion, understanding, and a greater well-being in our day-to-day -day life, even if it starts out as simple as a daily meditation practice. During his time in meditation, Siddhartha, now a fully enlightened Buddha, came to believe that the way to enlightenment is found in a practice called the Middle Way. This Middle Way can be split into two separate practices. The first aspect of the middle way is the spiritual practice that steers clear of both extreme ascetism and the surrender to desire. This basically aims to promote balance between the two, where ascetism promotes a lifestyle of abstinence, the rejections of possessions, and the practice of things like voluntary hardship and fasting, and where indulgence has one openly submit to whatever passions, desire, or impulse they might have at any given moment. This middle way promotes the balance between the two. The path to enlightenment, the Buddha says, 
is not found in either extreme, but somewhere in the middle. And it's probably likely that this perfect balance will differ from person to person depending on our temperament. And ultimately, this balance is our responsibility to find. Each of us will know when we're being too indulgent. Similarly, each of us will know when we've leaned too far into abstinence. The second aspect of the middle way is a more philosophical one and concerns the nature of how we view our fundamental existence. The teaching of the Buddha again warns about extremes. In this case, it's the extremes of annihilationism and eternalism. Where annihilationism is the belief that the self or soul is completely annihilated upon death, and where eternalism is the belief that there is an ever-present and unchanging self that transcends the cycle of birth and death. The issues that come with annihilationism are such that it can lead to nihilism, where nihilism is the view that rejects fundamental aspects of human existence, believing that human values are baseless, that life is meaningless, and that knowledge is impossible. And the issues with eternalism are that if one believes that the self is an ever-present and unchanging being, it may lead to the belief that one cannot change who they are, that they are not malleable or flexible, therefore not being capable of moving from a state of suffering or destruction to a state of well-being and enlightenment. The balance of this middle way led to the middle idea that a person can change their nature, moving closer and closer to enlightenment, and that they will carry this change with them onto the next life. Whether or not you believe in reincarnation, I do still think that the belief that a person has the ability to change their nature for the better is a constructive belief to have, regardless of whether or not we carry that into our next life. Similarly, I believe that the belief that life has meaning is a helpful one, where nihilism is an unhelpful one. However, where you find this meaning will vary from person to person. Some will find it in karma, like the Buddhists. Others will find it in God, like many theistic religions. But others, like myself, will simply find it by deciding what the meaning of their life will be, and living with the understanding that meaning is something that's not found outside of the self, but rather something that we have to decide for ourselves.